I'm going to read an introduction because uh, Hal was regaling us at the table with a number of tales, and if I started just ad-libbing about Hal, this would go on for the evening, and he's our keynote speaker. So I'll just uh, stick in my script, Hal. Well, good evening. I'm John Wood, as you have heard a couple of times, the Interim Executive Director. That's really been my privilege, and I want to thank you for that opportunity. Um, <clears throat> it's my honor tonight to introduce Harry Lee Poe, or Hal, as he's called by us in the ASA world. And uh, Hal is a longtime member of the ASA. He's a, de a designated fellow, a past executive council member, past president of the ASA. And this means that he's well known among our members. He's served the ASA for years. He knows our history. So how appropriate it, it is tonight, Hal, that you'll be giving us this keynote address at this legacy gala dinner. There is much more detail I could give you than is in his bio, which is in our program. You'll see those details there. I, I'm not going to take time to go through all of that, but I'll touch on a couple of highlights. There are some interesting accomplishments of this remarkable scholar. But he's also a true Southern gentleman. His educational and familial roots are in the, in the Deep South, and it shows in how he conducts himself. I've known two Poes in my life, but I never imagined that they would be related. The first Poe that I met was through a famous meme in a poem that begins, once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of some one gently tapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more, and yes, it goes on to repeat that famous phrase, quoth the raven, nevermore. That was the first Poe that I met early in my uh, years. I was trying to dredge back, Hal, to when it was, whether it was in late grade school, probably in junior high school somewhere. And the imaginative world that, that he had created was just stunning. But tonight, we won't be napping, I hope, even after this delicious dinner. For the next Poe I met here at the ASA, our own Hal, is a scholar with over 200 publications, multiple books, including on Edgar Allan Poe, his famous relative, and especially on C.S. Lewis. Hal is, as you know, the Charles Colson Professor of Faith and Culture at Union University. In addition, he has been a senior administrator, a pastor, and significantly a prison chaplain. Now that's a role that I just learned about when I read his bio here. We had not mentioned that before. And it's a very important one. For caring for the widow and the fatherless, that is for orphans, is an important biblical command to the church. And as Charles Colson found, prison is the place where one goes to find our orphaned women and men in our society. For it is in that single institution that we have populations filled with the fatherless, the orphaned. And Hal knows that firsthand in ministry. And I just found that fascinating. We will have to talk about that. Among his accomplishments, Hal, together with his colleague Jimmy Davis, who is here tonight in the audience, um, were awarded the Templeton Foundation Science and Religion course in 1998. You see that in there. And that became the basis of a publication and a fruitful relationship of working together over the years. And I think it's a model for many of us to follow and to think about. I know we've had those kinds of awards in our own institution, Hal. And it, bringing together women and men in the natural and social sciences and the humanities into that kind of conversation has been 
probably one of the most significant things in terms of changing our thinking and changing the dialogue, and Hal's been an important leader in that area. Hal has another connection to the history of the ASA, and that you might not know. He is an outstanding C.S. Lewis scholar, and just a few weeks ago, Hal returned from the C.S. Lewis Summer Institute in Oxford and Cambridge. He has multiple books on Lewis, lectures widely there, a number of places, and he has one essay in particular that caught my attention. It's called C.S. Lewis, Science and Technology. In that essay, we are reminded that Lewis had a keen interest in science and society. Many of us cut our teeth on that trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, Perlandra, and That Hideous Strength. It took me a number of years to get through that hideous strength. That <laughs> was the most challenging reading. Um, what Hal noticed with Lewis, as he did with his own relative, Edgar Allan Poe, that these individuals, these humanists, had a keen interest in science and that both of them had explored and anticipated cutting edge ideas in science in the 19th and 20th century. I think there's a lesson in that for us, Hal. It raises, they were raising fundamental questions in anticipation. We need each other. And for us, Hal writes on Lewis this lesson. It's a quote. The best apologetics is not little Christian books, but little books by Christians on every subject with Christianity latent therein. Hal has certainly filled that promise with his scholarly output. And there's yet one last thing that I want to make in terms of connection with Lewis and the ASA and Hal. And Hal makes it this way. We began this affiliation in 1941 as a response to the need of the church to do, have a better understanding and interaction with that great social formation called the sciences. Tonight, Hal is going to tell us something of that rich legacy, in particular with a focus on what the ASA has meant to him. Would you join me in welcoming Hal Poe to our platform? Hal. Well, as you no doubt gathered from all of that, I am not a scientist. Um, I'm, a, if you'll pardon the expression, a theologian. Um, but um, like Lady Catherine de Bourgh, who said that um, had I, I, I should have been a proficient as a pianist had I learned, um, I could have been a great scientist. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> Um, hanging around y'all for um, some 22 years or so, I've realized there's really not much to scientists. Um, and I, when I tell people about the ASA, I say, well, it's an organization of about 2,000 scientists, Christians who are scientists, and four theologians. Now, that's not exactly right. <laughs> but not being right has never bothered me before. <laughs> You just stare into a person's eyes and say it. Um, but I had made some assumptions about our organization. As you're probably aware, among the scientists, uh, the sciences, um, the most religious are the physicists. A greater percentage of physicists believe in some kind of God. Doesn't mean they're Christian, but they. Um, tend to. And the least religious are the biologists. Lowest percentage believe in God, but not in the ASA. Um, I was surprised to learn that the um, uh, subgroup of scientists who are the largest body in our group are the biologists. 286 biologists. Now, I'm sure had I learned anything about biology, I would have been a proficient, but the problem with biology, as the rest of us know, is it's, it's, 
too squishy and gushy and slimy. I mean, so we're, we're glad you're part of our group and we're glad you're a large number, but I, I, uh, I've worked with Jimmy Davis now for, well, we've been in this dialogue for 26 years. Um, he's a chemist. He's a lovely person with many fine qualities, but as the rest of you know, the problem with chemistry is it's just too smelly. <laughs> um, so I, I, I didn't pursue chemistry. Now physics, we have, oh, I, I should have told you, we have 221 chemists. Now we come down, there are more chemists than physicists. Uh, physicists, there are 212 of you. Now what has always amazed me about physicists is they don't really do anything. <laughs> I mean, you ask a physicist, now what is it you do? And they'll tell you, matter and energy. <laughs> well, show me that, well, you really can't see it. You just have to imagine it. <laughs> Well, I used to do that with my mother and my homework. <laughs> um, and then the mathematicians, you know, whenever the physicists start talking about, well, we use imaginary numbers. The, the table of the mathematicians, they just uh, double over in laughter and say, all numbers are imaginary. So, um, well, this brings us down to the engineers. Now, the engineers, 193 strong in this organization, these are the smart ones. <laughs> Have you noticed they build these enormous things that have to be torn down and built again and torn down and built again? And they're making a fortune tearing things down and building them again. They're, they're, they're the smart ones. They know about job security. <laughs> now, I thought there were just four theologians in the ASA. As it turns out, there are 120 theologians in the ASA. But where are they? <laughs> um, so I'm, I, I suppose I'm not alone. Um, one thing that Jimmy and I have noticed in our work on science and religion, that most of the conflict in science and religion has nothing to do with science and it has nothing to do with religion. It's the philosophy that's the problem. <laughs> now we're getting down to it. The philosophers. We have 48 philosophers in the ASA and they haven't solved this problem yet. <laughs> Just, just resting on their laurels, I suppose, since Plato and Aristotle. But there's work to be done. And there are 44 ministers, uh, clergy that are um, practice, practicing pastors or missionaries, um, which brings it back to me. So why did you ask a theologian, well, John gave the game away. I'm really a Baptist preacher. Why did they ask me, who writes about C.S. Lewis and Edgar Allan Poe and evangelism, to give the after dinner talk? We've got all these eminent scientists with international reputations and uh, enormous accomplishments who might have given the after dinner talk. Um, in fact, the 47 that were asked might have done it. <laughs> the problem is, you may have noticed, did you find this at your plate? And, and this one? Well, I'm the only one who's preached the annual stewardship sermon <laughs> 40 times. Um, so yes, this, this is a celebration of 
80 years, we didn't get to be together for the 80th year, so we're a couple of years late. But to be around for 80 years is an enormous accomplishment. Some of you have been around half of that time. Some of you, more than half of that time. Um, Jimmy Davis and I are a part of the success of the ASA in reaching new people. Uh, there really weren't very many people from the South in the ASA um, 22 years ago. And um, we were encouraged by several different people we came in contact with. Terry Morrison, who's not here, another chemist, um, uh, working with InterVarsity uh, uh, graduate and faculty uh, ministry. Um, used to come to Union regularly to do some workshops with us, and he encouraged us to join. Bob Fay, who taught chemistry at um, Cornell, many of you know him. We ran into each other at a C.S. Lewis conference um, that same year, Jimmy, 1998, when we won the, the Templeton Teaching Award. And Walter Bradley, who is in the hospital tonight. Um, dear people who aren't here, that I, I wanted to see them. Um, they all encouraged us to join. We checked it out, and uh, we've been a part of things ever since. Jimmy and I have discovered that scholarship flourishes most when we have collegial people to talk with about issues of importance and um, to join in this dialogue of, of science and faith where it's genuine questions, where we're, um, this morning we were, we were um, told about the importance of creating a safe space to have conversations. This is a safe space. I've listened to the questions that have been asked of uh, our presenters and our plenary speakers uh, the last day. And what struck me about the tone and the attitude of the questioning, it, they were hard questions, probing questions, but they were helpful questions. They were the kind of questions that allowed the speaker to grapple more with their own subject and to be able to say, I don't know, but it, it helps me think how I need to come back and work on my subject some more because let's face it, we are all involved in a work in progress. At least I hope we are. I hope none of us think we have quite finished what we're doing. Um, and so Jimmy and I have looked back on the, the four books that we've done together, and we've realized that every one of them grew out of some conversations that we had in meetings like this with some other people. And um, our imaginations were stimulated, and things began to, to happen. Um, my first ASA annual meeting I attended. I belonged for several years before I could make a meeting. I was enjoying um, the journal, Perspectives, but I'd not been to a meeting. Calvin College, I don't remember the year, but Randy Isaacs had just become the executive director, and I didn't know a soul in the room. And Ted Davis, and Jennifer Wiseman invited me to sit down at their table and eat lunch. Have you ever read the Gospels? Have you ever noticed how many times Jesus eats with people? And how important that is. Have you experienced that yourself at the ASA? Have you experienced this week? I hope so. And um, I hope you will before the the week is out. Um, this, um, this is important. 
This is one of the most important things we do. Um, the ASA is not just another professional society for scientists. You've got the guild that you belong to. Every, every branch of science has its um, guild with its publications, its um, uh, annual meetings, and its politics. This organization, though, does something more. Um, God has called us to a mission. Uh, it was mentioned once, I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, to integrate, communicate, and facilitate properly researched science and theology in service to the church and the scientific community. That's a huge calling. And I think it's a calling that is more critical now that in any moment in the 80 years of our history, We've had 80 years to get ready for a desperate time in our culture. Uh, we were born in the cauldron of World War II. When five scientists met in September of 1941, the war was raging in uh, the Pacific. The United States wasn't involved in it yet. The war was raging in Europe. The United States wasn't involved in it yet. But a few months later, we were. And that's the context in which we started in a time of crisis and adversity and danger and fear and uncertainty. By 1948, the membership stood at 73. Five years later, 1953, the membership had grown to 498. Ten years later, the membership stood at 909. So we were born in war, but notice how the growth just skyrocketed. Born in war, we grew during the spiritual awakening of 1946 to 1963. We sometimes forget that there was an incredible spiritual awakening in this country in those years, which saw the birth of so many Christ-centered organizations such as InterVarsity, The Navigators, Campus Crusade, Christianity Today, Gordon Conwell Seminary, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and many, 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 many more. The ASA was part, it was just one piece, one small piece of something that was happening globally. And it was that period that church leaders would look back on nostalgically as the golden days. Have you ever heard old pastors talk about it or some of you? Uh, remember those days. Um, I was born in 1950. I grew up when the churches were exploding and were dynamic and were exciting and all sorts of things were happening. It was a time when the Holy Spirit moved powerfully among his people. It's harder to flourish in a secular, materialistic setting than in a spiritual awakening. As people of faith, however, we must ask, what has God put us here to do in our world today? Um, it's going to take more effort than it did in the 50s more thought, <clears throat> but we are still involved in a supernatural enterprise. We worship someone who rose from the dead. We someone, worship someone who oversees the entire universe. And he's called us 
And he's promised that his Holy Spirit will empower us to do whatever he puts before us. One thing I've noticed about God is he's not stupid. <laughs> and he does not ask us to do anything that we cannot do because he is the one who empowers us and works through us and in us to accomplish his good purposes. So we now live in a culture that offers us some incredible opportunities for conversations. Um, the, the, um, the cultural context is amazing. We were talking about it at, at supper tonight. Video games and movies and streaming video services and TV. And um, all of this creates a certain mindset in the culture attitudes towards things. It's, it's very subtle. Um, John chose to give away the show, my big C.S. Lewis quote, so I'm going to repeat it. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the midst of the, um, the beginning of that spiritual awakening that came in the aftermath of World War II, some youth ministers asked C.S. Lewis to talk to them about how you do apologetics. And he gave them a lot of pointers about apologetic issues and how to approach them, how to deal with them. And he was dealing with some issues related to science. And he said, while well, we're on the subject of science, what we need is not more little Christian books, but more little books on every subject with the Christianity latent. He went on to say, the science has to be perfectly honest. You don't fudge the science to make your argument work. But we have an incredible opportunity now. Flying here from um, the wilds of West Tennessee, I watched uh, a movie that just came out this year, Moonfall. Anybody seen Moonfall? It's terrific. The moon has slipped out of its orbit and is about to careen into the planet Earth. There you have it. Now, how could that possibly happen? Well, now I'll explain it to you. You see, the moon is actually a giant spaceship. It's hollow on the inside, but it has a dwarf star inside that's powering its uh, system. You didn't know about this sort of stuff, did you, Jennifer? Just pay attention. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'll answer them later. <laughs> and, um, of course, our ancestors built this thing several billion years ago, and um, they had accidentally built this supercomputer that ran everything for them, only it achieved consciousness and decided the best thing to do was eliminate all carbon life forms. So it was extinguishing our ancestors, but not before they had a chance to uh, slip a little DNA in a module and send it down to Earth where it could seed the Earth and given enough time, um, uh, here we are. But anyway, here, here in this movie, in latent form, that's the, that's the great thing that's, that's taking place. It's not an argument. Um, it's a story. And latent in the story is this idea of artificial intelligence and the achievement of consciousness, transhumanism, um, on and on and on. There are a lot of different visions for what constitutes science in the world. And um, unfortunately, one aspect of the world we live in right now is it's profoundly ignorant. There is a general ignorance of science and of history 
Um, Keith gave a, uh, a, a fine presentation this morning, and one, he talked about some of the things that are missing <laughs> in our world today. And one was a, was a knowledge of, of history. Um, and somebody is going to provide a substitute, and that's what's coming through the popular cultural forms. But... People will talk about movies all day long. And the context exists there for conversations, um, the kind of conversation that we're equipped to have. Um, so there's an ignorance of science, but there's also an ignorance of, of theology. Have you noticed that um, seminaries are dying? You name the denomination, the seminaries are dying. Um, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary had 4,000 students. In 1975, I think they've got about 300 now. Um, you've probably heard that Gordon Conwell um, is closing its campus and moving into Boston, selling the property. They've declined, some seminaries have uh, thrown in the towel already. And what's happening, it's not because the population of the United States has gotten so small that we can't support seminaries anymore, but churches aren't sending their young to seminaries to be trained for the ministry. That's not happening. And... Um, at the end of the 19th century, churches in the United States wanted an educated ministry. That was one of the goals. You can go back and look at the, 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 the goals of the state denominations, and you'll find it just across the board. They, they started colleges and seminaries. They wanted an educated clergy. Churches in the United States today want an ignorant clergy. It's a strange thing. Um, don't go to seminary, stay here, we'll raise you up. And you'll learn how to do, um, um, well, a podcast, and we'll teach you how to do um, uh, the sound system, and we'll teach you how to um, plan the big meeting. You just won't study the scriptures. So... Um, Christians have a, a challenge ahead. And we're part of that as the ASA. We've got a piece of that that we need to be involved with. Um, for some of us, the challenge has been helping people see the validity of the Christian faith, faith in God, uh, the Father Almighty, maker in heaven and earth. To, have, uh, to see the validity of that kind of faith in a world where science is understood to mean materialism. For others of us, Jimmy and I have had a, an entirely different challenge in our corner of the world where our challenge is to help people see the validity of science in a world where faith is understood in legalistic and literalistic terms. And so entirely different challenges in the same country. Um, we now live in a culture which has undergone a major shift from trust in science to suspicion of science. And um, in that context, the ASA is called to go into the future. Um, we are more than an institution, even though we've been here 80 years. We're more than an organization. We're a fellowship. I, I, I keep reflecting on the idea of what it means to be a fellowship. In the New Testament, fellowship is an incredibly precious thing. And in our world, it's a rare thing. It doesn't simply mean getting together from time to time to have a meal. 
But in the New Testament sense, the meal is the most intimate of all social occasions. It's what the family does. And the kind of fellowship which we enjoy among ourselves in the ASA goes to the very heart of who we are as people called by God and equipped to help the world make sense of the world. You can help people make sense of the world. And in spite of uh, general ignorance of science within our culture, there are people who would provide a vision of science on the right and on the left. Remember Carl Sagan and his PBS series Cosmos? Remember how it began? He had this picture of a galaxy far, far away. This is the cosmos. It is all there is or ever will be. Now, while this ASA was starting here in the United States, C.S. Lewis was spending the decade of the 1940s refuting the, that materialistic view of science. And he was pointing out the difference between science and this philosophical leech that had latched onto it called materialism or naturalism. And he did it in a number of essays, a number of books, and in a, a number of science fiction novels, including that hideous strength, my favorite of them, by the way. Um, Y'all remember Winnie the Pooh? Winnie the Pooh liked stories, but mainly he liked stories about himself. And that hideous strength <laughs> is, is about the university. <laughs> the ASA can survive. We can, but God did not call us together to survive. Survival is a pretty tawdry goal. Our leaders here in the ASA decided it was time for us to do more than survive, and they realized it would take money to make a bigger impact, to do something. After 80 years, we had an endowment of $250,000. And a group of us were asked to put together a plan to increase our endowment. Goals are supposed to be realistic. That's one of the things they teach us early on in strategic planning. You need realistic goals. None of these pie-in-the-sky goals. But we wanted to be bold. And we wanted to double our endowment to $500,000 during this campaign to grow by 100%. Now, that's pretty outrageous. And it doesn't sound very realistic. And you, know, you might push back just a little bit. As we talk, though, we believe God was calling us to do something impossible instead of something realistic. We thought about the number of our committed members and how many people who might be concerned with our mission that we've never contacted. People you know who are interested in the kinds of things we're doing who are interested in our mission, who realize how it's Im important that we've never really talked to about being involved with our, our work. So instead of $500,000, we've set a goal of $5 million. That's what, that's what I thought. Five million dollars. 
It doesn't take much money to survive. It really doesn't. But if we expect to do anything that makes a difference at a critical moment in our time, we're going to have to pay for it. We're going to have to provide the staff and the resources to do challenging things. And so tonight we kick off the campaign. And if the idea of raising $5 million over the next two years sounds crazy to you, you might be interested to know that while we've been planning this endowment campaign during COVID, some of you have already given $3 million to the endowment. I would just point out to you that we serve a God who does impossible things. When I began serving the ASA 10 years ago, I remember hearing about this legendary character named Walt Hearn. When I asked Walt to write one of our annual fund appeals, I was impressed not only with his writing style, but also with his ability to intertwine humor and creativity into a compelling story. But what impressed me most was his passion, dedication, and loyalty to the ASA. After meeting he and his wife Ginny in their eclectic home in Berkeley, along with several other long-standing ASA members, I thought to myself, if these people are any indication of what ASA members are like, this is an organization where I want to invest my time. Walt was an active ASA ambassador as well as a faithful donor for 66 years, urging everyone he knew to join this organization that meant so much to him. Walt not only ministered to people through his thoughtful writings and personal interactions, but also by his example of giving to others. In the wake of the Hearns' passings, we were humbled to receive a substantial gift from their estate designated for the ASA endowment because they wanted to ensure the legacy of the organization that they held so dearly. The Hearns are one of hundreds of ASA members that I've now had the privilege of meeting. Our members are the lifeblood of the organization, and it is through their stories, kingdom advancement stories, that tell the rich story of the ASA. My first encounter with the ASA was through an ASA member, Dr. Joe Sheldon, who has been speaking into my life for the past 20 years. The ASA has really become a home for me. It's a community, it's a family, it's just a place where I truly felt like I belonged. I'm so grateful to the ASA for their wonderful support and for all the opportunities that they've given me. Um, I'm especially grateful to them during difficult times like my PhD that can be pretty challenging, but also during times when I've just been called to be brave as I just fine tune and further work on the calling that God has for me. I was told in high school that scientists were generally atheists. They wanted to show that God didn't exist and that uh, the Bible was false. Then I went to Wheaton College and there my professors told me about the ASA. At ASA I met real scientists who were Christians and they were genuine scientists seeking to show the truth about nature and about Christian faith. That changed my life. Throughout my graduate school and early career, the ASA really helped me to sustain my faith. So now I strongly support the ASA because I want other graduate students and young scientists to be able to engage with outstanding scientists in every discipline in order to discuss both science and the relationship with Christian faith. Disruptive and changing times call for clarity and courage. The ASA is eight decades old, yet we are rapidly changing. 
Transforming the ASA from a small but effective 20th century fellowship into a professional and scholarly community of Christians serving members across North America and around the world takes more than courage and imagination. It takes resources. Today, the Executive Council is intent on our mission, on good governance, and on securing our future impact. And the ASA leadership team is adding experienced directors as our means to continuing growth and to excellence in member services. The ASA is unique. We are a Christian professional and scholarly society that builds value into the lives of our members across their entire career and calling. I have been in the ASA since 1974, when my professor, Jim Kennedy, gave me a trial membership. It was that easy to imagine a future in the ASA. Join me in sponsoring the mission of the ASA for the next generation of leaders in science and faith and in the church. My name is Mike Beidler and I serve on the ASA's Executive Council. In Dallas Willard's book, The Divine Conspiracy, Willard challenges the reader to think about what actually believing in the reality of the Trinity looks like. And that made me wonder, what would it look like for me and my wife Crystal to believe? To put faith into action in the reality of the ASA, which, like the Trinity, is a vibrant community. We wanted to recognize the ASA's ability to challenge our thinking, to affirm our shared faith and to nourish our souls. So in the light of Job's reflection that you can't take it with you in the end, we decided, in addition to our monthly giving, to pledge to the ASA's legacy campaign, which will help grow the ASA's endowment. That pledge consists of leaving a percentage of retirement funds to the ASA once Jesus Christ calls us home. And we would like for you to prayerfully consider doing the same. The ASA is positioned to meet the needs of this next generation through the launching of the ASA Legacy Campaign. A strong endowment opens the door for a lasting impact across the entire organization. Combined with planned gifts and responsible investment, it creates reliable annual income for operational priorities. We will bolster our endowment to build member value, invest in the next generation, respond to strategic opportunities, and maintain institutional health. Together we will build an enduring legacy that lives on for generations to come. Walt and Ginny's donation was the seed gift for the campaign and since then many have invested. We are thrilled with the exciting opportunities that this endeavor makes possible for the ASA. If you believe in the life-changing experiences you've just heard or have been impacted yourself, we invite you to join us in this bold campaign. Most importantly, we welcome your prayers as we strive to answer God's call to ensure a legacy for the future. Thank you so much for partnering with the ASA in this important kingdom work for God's glory.